Okay, so we've started recording. So this is my notice to everyone who is in here that this uh, uh, webinar is being recorded. So as this is a webinar, your cameras and your mics should be off by default. So if you have something you'd like to share with us, make sure you put it in the chat. Um, if you would like everyone in the chat to see it, make sure you change the little to uh, um, selection there to everyone. Otherwise, you can just send it to myself and Dr. McKiernan Gonzalez because, uh, you know, we'll be able to uh, see it that way. Um, so let me see my other housekeeping stuff. Um, if you have questions about the content of the presentation today and you would like our speaker to answer them, please make sure to put those in the Q&A. Uh, every once in a while, the chat gets very busy and I might miss it. So uh, asking that in the Q&A will uh, allow us to catch it. You also can ask uh, anonymously in case you do not want your name attached to a specific question. Um, so you guys know I am going to be issuing attendance certificates for those of you who stay for the majority of the uh, uh, talk. If you are here only for like 10 minutes and then have to leave, I understand. Uh, you will get a link to the recording once that is available, but you will not get a uh, certificate of attendance. That's only for folks who stay for the bulk of the event. Um, I really appreciate when uh, the presentation is over, if you fill out our uh, survey, uh, we have a feedback survey that helps us continue to do presentations like this and bring uh, fabulous guest speakers for the uh, STC community. So I really appreciate that. So yes, let's get started. So. Um, First of all, my name is Heather Bobrowitz. I am the programming librarian here at STC Library. I am based on Pecan Campus. And it is my uh, honor today to introduce you to our guest speaker, uh, Dr. John McKiernan Gonzalez. He is a distinguished speaker with the Organization of American Historians. Let me give you a little bit of his background. So he's also the director of the Center for Study of the Southwest the Jerome and Catherine Supple Professor of Southwestern Studies and Associate Professor of History at Texas State University. His first book, which he'll be talking about a lot in this presentation, uh, Fevered Measures, uh, Public Health and Race at the Texas-Mexico Border Between 1848 and 1942, was published in 2012, and it treats the multi-ethnic making of the U.S. medical border in the Mexico-Texas borderlands. He co-edited the volume Precarious Prescriptions, Contested Histories of Race and Health in North America, published in uh, 2013, which examines the contradictions and complexities tying medical history and communities of color together. His broad takes on Latines in the U.S. medical history uh, history can be found in American Latinos in the making of the United States and in keywords in Latina slash Latino studies as published in 2017. He has worked collaboratively with the National Museum of American History, the National Minority AIDS Council, the Workers' Defense Project, the Social Science Research Council's Mellon Mays Advisory, and Whole Women's Health. His next project, Working Conditions, Medical Authority, and Latino Civil Rights, tracks the changing place of medicine in Lat and in Latina struggles for equality. Born in... Uh, the U.S. He grew up in Colombia, Mexico, and the U.S. South, and graduated from Oberlin and the University of Michigan. He brings a migrant eye and experience to his projects in public history, medical history, immigration history, and Latina studies. Uh, this incredible list of accomplishments and unique perspective are the reasons why South Texas College Library is so thrilled to host his lecture today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McKiernan Gonzalez. I will be around watching the chat in case anybody has any technical questions. So uh, good afternoon, buenas tardes. 
Um, I hope you're all um, well. Um, the first thing I want to say is uh, thank you to everyone who invited me to South Texas College. Uh, I want to thank all the archivists and librarians that made this book possible. Um, and I want to thank the OH for finding something of interest in a book about um, epidemics and quarantines um, along the Rio Grande or across the Rio Grande between 1848 and 1942. Um, the OH titled uh, the lecture, Challenges in Healthcare Services on the Border. Um, and I think um, the challenges that I outline in the book and ch these challenges don't disappear is the way that um, public health um, and public health prevention became a proxy for determining who was a citizen of the United States and who was not a citizen of the United States. And the mission creep uh, to um, stop um, and prevent illness and disease, or at least prevent communicable disease, also became a mission to protect US citizens uh, from disease, actually just to protect US citizens. And as you all know, um, the process of determining who is a US citizen and who is not a US citizen, um, is uh, deeply complicated and it's even more complicated um, in places like um, McAllen, Brownsville, Chicago, uh, Denver, Colorado, to try to tell the difference between who is Mexican American and who is Mexican and who is not. So the first challenge in healthcare services on the border um, that I will be discussing is of course this mission creep, the difference between public health to prevent illness and then public health to prevent illnesses for American citizens and the way that they bear out. The other thing I wanna do is I wanna make sure that I only take about 35 minutes to 30 minutes um, for this conversation. This book came out of my experiences uh, working as a public health officer and epidemiologist in Chicago, uh, dealing with um, Spanish speaking communities, dealing with uh, my peers in the public health department and dealing with being a young man in young Latino in Chicago at the time and seeing the world. And these three sort of like ways of experiencing the world shaped my uh, desire and my urge to tell a story about how uh, Mexican Mexicans, Mexican immigrants or Mexican Americans encountered the American public health system and how the American public health system um, did not respond very well to the concerns that uh, Latino communities in Chicago and everywhere else have experienced had with them. So um, I'm really interested in your questions and I hope that your questions can then lead on to larger research projects yourselves. So here we go, challenges um, in healthcare services on the border. And there's two um, pictures on the cover of this book. One is of a quarantine camp in um, Eagle Pass in 1895. Um, that contained mostly African-Americans who were fleeing Mexico. The picture itself is taken by a uh, physician that became very prominent after um, this, this smallpox quarantine camp. His name was Milton Rosenau, and he went on to become a physician that challenged, um, that challenged the policies of quarantine. The picture below that is of the Santa Fe Street Bridge um, in the middle of winter. It's on a postcard and it marks the movement of the streetcar into Ciudad Juarez from El Paso. And it sort of like marks the to and fro that marks sort of like the experience of the border um, for most um, people who lived in let's say Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, in Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, in Brownsville and in Matamoros, sort of like marking that kind of process. Um, <clears throat> so what I wanted to do was sort of like get a sense of a shared engagement with medical authority. And that means the ways in which um, um, patients come into medical settings, into clinical settings with the sense of how they should be treated just as much as the ways in which um, physicians, nurses, um, social workers also have an expectation for the way that they should be treated and that they should be treating um, the patients that are coming in. That is, 
um, that the diseases that bring them together, the injuries that bring them together, um, people expect a level of overlap in terms of the expectations. And part of this is my experience of working in a public health clinic in Chicago, well, in suburban Chicago, um, which wasn't really very suburban, um, and all the different kinds of people that would come into the community and that you'd have to spend a lot of time trying to listen to what their concerns were, why were they, why they were there and why they were sort of like trying to understand um, what I was trying to explain or what other physicians were trying to explain at the time. So I have here that I wanted to sort of like encompass many communities, that there are multiple forms of entry into the medical encounter and that people left uh, the same encounter with different experiences and different stories about the encounter. That is, uh, one would hope that there'd be a shared understanding, but sometimes a shared understanding um, Hid the um, uh, hid the different kinds of experience that people had within the shared setting. Um, and the other thing is uh, we're looking at a time period, which is also a time period that we've experienced that was that there was a drastic change in understandings of how um, communicable diseases were transmitted between people. It went from a moment when people consider that your environment, the conditions that you lived in, the different kinds of organic material that was in that environment, um, if it combined in particular ways, it could create illnesses and diseases among people. And slowly but surely, people began to understand that some illnesses, uh, at first smallpox, um, then yellow fever, then malaria, then cholera, then typhus actually had germs, little seeds um, that then became understood to became bacteria, um, bacteria or viruses or germs or spirochetes that could actually be transmitted between animals and people or between people and people. However, the process from sort of like identifying smallpox, something you go from one person to another person to let's say typhus with being um, lice that transmit the spirochet of typhus from rats to people um, was about 100 years. So we're looking at the second half of these 100 years to come to a shared understanding of disease. So what the Mexican border became between 1880, that is after the Civil War in the United States, after Reconstruction, after the big 1878 yellow fever epidemic that shut down the United States because it went all the way up from New Orleans, all the way to north of St. Louis, up to Peoria, Illinois, um, in terms of people coming down with yellow fever, is there was a national concern for what was the best way to protect um, businesses and to protect people. So between 1880, with the creation of the National Board of Health, all the way to 1917, um, the U.S.-Mexican border became a place where the United States drew lines to protect citizens. Um, and citizens was um, un undergoing vast array. Uh, citizens meant as much white people, thanks to Reconstruction. It also meant African Americans, um, thanks to the 14th Amendment. It meant everyone who was born in the United States. Um, but even though it's an inclusive idea of citizenship, uh, there are ways in which the understanding of citizenship was not necessarily quite so inclusive. It might have focused more on, let's say, Gabachos or white people and that kind of process. But the other thing, because the uh, communities, um, the urban communities and the rural communities along the Rio Grande were not as politically enfranchised as communities, let's say in Baltimore, in San Francisco, in New York, um, the federal government had much more authority to, um, much more authority to be able to make policies that match their understanding of what the best way was to prevent disease. So what this actually means that between 1880 and about 1917, um, the US-Mexico border became a key launching pad to try out new public health policies. I have at the front of the bus, and what this means is that if people drive the bus, and you think a lot about the different kinds of people that go on a bus, uh, the U.S.-Mexican border was at the front of the bus of medical progress. Um, and I don't think most people think about uh, the U.S.-Mexico borderlands as a place for medical progress. Um, and I think that's an unfortunate thing because, of course, progress happens 
in a number of places. This um, talk is going to focus on three epidemics and uh, three quarantines that happened um, a, that, that affected the traffic between uh, the United States and Mexico. And I'd like to sort of like, again, highlight this part of the United States and Mexico is that I probably if I did this map again, I would have included steamship lines, um, but it was the railroads that connected central Mexico to the south, to the southwest, and to the far west, which then also meant that the railroads connected the black and white communities of um, the south to the black, brown, and white communities of Texas, to the black, brown, red, uh, Asian, uh, yellow, I guess, Asian communities in El Paso and New Mexico and California, and sort of like the railroad helped bring them all together. And what the public health program became concerned with was how to control the movement of people that were connected to railroads. The first railroad that connected Mexico to the United States was the Texas-Mexico Railroad, which went from Corpus Christi to Laredo, then followed by the Missouri Pacific that went up there. So I have this map of railroads that mark the connections. And 82, 1882 marks a moment when the railroads are completed, connecting uh, Laredo to central Mexico, but also um, becoming a moment when a yellow fever epidemic emerges in Mexico because also of railroad construction and then moves to the United States. Um, I then look at 1895 in terms of shift of the way that people wanted to treat diseases and how sort of like the um, Eagle Pass border and the Eagle Pass quarantine provide an opportunity to test out a disease treatment. And then 1903, and I think this might be a little rushed, is thinking about how uh, conflicts between the ways that the majority of ethnic, the majority of Laredo, um, thought that they should be treated versus the way that a set of um, Laredo's elite thought they should treat the rest of Laredo and how that then sort of like turned into what's known as the 1903 uh, Laredo smallpox riot. And I have 1948 up there because it marks the last uh, smallpox epidemic in the United States that has a distant connection to Laredo, but it's right there. So um, this is of course a picture of the US border before the germ theory, but also in 1846, marking the places where um, the taxpaying citizens of Mexico lived. Um, and I would have included Texas in that process, but of course, Texas had its own idea of where the border lay between Mexico and the United States. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about, actually, now I'm going to sort of like burrow down into the uh, Texas-Mexico yellow fever epidemic, or otherwise known sometimes as Texas-Mexican yellow fever epidemic and the United States Marine Hospital Service. And if this were not a webinar, I would ask some people to describe what's in front of you, but this is one of the maps that was uh, established by um, the U.S. Uh, Marine Hospital Service, it went on to become the U.S. Public Health Service, and it marks the places where yellow fever epidemic had been identified over the course of the epidemic, and it also drew a line between sort of like what they considered to be a defensible line between uh, Mexico and the United States. And if you look at the map, um, the line that uh, the United States drew between Mexico and the United States went from Laredo to Corpus Christi. Everything south of that of that map, of that line, was considered to be part of the yellow fever epidemic and not necessarily part of the United States. Um, everyone behind that, south of that line, was meant to be held there. Um, in Mexico, um, the consensus in Mexico was that quarantines against yellow fever epidemics um, didn't work. They hadn't worked in the past. Yellow fever was caused by a complex combination of um, organic decay, different temperatures, and particular kinds of materials that might sort of like spark off an epidemic. And the best thing you could do to prevent the yellow fever epidemic was clean all the streets, uh, throw out all the water, make sure there was nothing sort of like uh, decaying in the public eye. Um, the reason why the U.S. was so concerned with sort of like slowing 
movement between um, the movement of disease between Mexico or the Gulf of Mexico and the rest of the United States was that five years earlier, um, the an, a yellow fever epidemic took hold of the Mississippi River Valley, um, shutting traffic between actually across the United States um, for about three months until the epidemic disappeared and people stopped falling from falling ill from disease in response to the business catastrophe that sort of like closed off rail traffic all across the United States. Um, Congress voted to create a national board of health to um, monitor the sanitary conditions of the United States and make sure that there wouldn't be more epidemics coming up. And they sort of like chartered to have uh, John Pope who was distinguished uh, doctor based in central Texas to do a review of the sanitary conditions in Texas that might lead to epidemics of malaria and yellow fever affecting the rest of the United States. And what um, John Pope found out when he was writing about the condition of the Mexican population in Southwest Texas, and this shouldn't be surprising to anyone uh, living in McAllen, is that almost all of um, civil society, almost all of working society, everything that was produced in South Texas, that was moved through South Texas, was touched by um, people of Mexican descent, um, by ethnic Mexicans. So after discussing that um, um, Mexican patients, according to the physicians he talked to, had very similar ideas of disease, but the only thing that sort of like uh, marked them as different is that when people fell ill, um, they wanted to make sure that they could accompany the people that were ill, keep things in family or in community to make sure that um, they would be okay. And uh, John Pope, uh, Dr. John Pope, thought that the ideal place to have people be treated for disease would be in a completely isolated, untouched a room where uh, family members couldn't come in, where people would just be sort of like under the authority of doctors and nurses. So actually his idea of how to treat illness was more peculiar, but because he was representing the United States nation, he could say the peculiar idea that people want to heal alongside other people would be peculiar. So for John Pope, uh, his idea of the Mexican cannot then indulge his peculiar ideas of epidemics, again, its care within a community context without involving some of the rest of us. What John Pope was doing was using something that I don't think uh, was that particularly controversial, but marking it as hypervisible. The hypervisibility of the healthcare, the community and family healthcare context that Mexicans uh, seem to embrace um, in Brownsville, in McAllen, in Laredo, and in the rest of what they then called Southwest Texas. Um, <clears throat> so thanks as well to the National Board of Health, um, the way that a quarantine was established in 18, after the National Board of Health was established in 1880, was that if someone announced that there was, um, that there was yellow fever there, it was an automatic designation of a quarantine, of a medical emergency. So in 1882, when um, HF French was the, um, Consul in uh, Matamoros uh, telegraphed the, the governor of Texas to let him know that there was yellow fever um, in Brownsville, that there was yellow fever in Matamoros. Um, this kicked off a uh, note up to the Secretary of the Treasury. The Secretary of the Treasury was actually HM, HF French, who then had just taken over the um, epidemic fund from the National Board of Health. Um, what he saw here in terms of this was the opportunity for the Secretary of the Treasury or for Treasury and the U.S. Marine Hospital Service to show that they could actually um, that they could actually prevent uh, the movement of yellow fever across the United States. It was an opportunity. So um, HF French telegraphed Governor Oren Milo Roberts to let him know that we will pay for quarantine guards into service. We'll also take charge of the hospital at Brownsville and we will create proper inspection stations if you desire. And 
those are two uh, very important uh, separate clauses. One is uh, paying for quarantine guards meant um, for the first time in about 50 years, the federal government would actually pay for like literally man the quarantine, identify people to draw a line, um, to cordon off, to cut off the places where people had disease from the rest of the places in the United States that did not have disease. And this was what we would call, um, what I call practice without theory. There was no medical theory that justified the quarantine guards. The reason you wanted to have quarantine guards in Corpus Christi, in Laredo, um, and in Brownsville was to show people in the rest of Texas that you're trying to do something to prevent disease. The other thing that the sentence says is like, we will also take charge of the hospital at Brownsville and uh, staff proper inspection stations if you desire. So, um, so what this meant is that the U.S. Marine Hospital Service would be in charge of all medical services in Brownsville, um, provide the kinds of inspections to get rid of the kinds of organic material that they thought might be in Brownsville that would sort of like cause um, yellow fever to catalyze and crystallize and sort of like affect other people and basically take charge of the town and clean it up um, from organic material and make it available. Once they arrive there, um, the quarantine caused its own particular issues. The quarantine guards prevented anyone from moving south from Brownsville to Matamoros, which then prevented the movement of goods and food and services from Matamoros to uh, Brownsville. Um, so once people stopped, lo lost their work of shipping goods from Monterrey to Matamoros to Brownsville, out to New Orleans, out to New York, once the transportation industry died, once the um, ability to sort of like access farms in the area died, people started to get sick out of starvation, out of hunger. And um, within a month, you have uh, Thomas Carson, who was one of the leading citizens of Brownsville at the time, asking for, for, for more money and for more care. So what the U.S. Marine Hospital Service then did after um, August 17th was it started paying for food. Uh, giving food, bringing food directly to people living in the houses of Brownsville. They also started, they also hired local nurses, local Spanish speaking nurses to help provide services uh, for people with malaria, people who had other diseases that they came down with, people with yellow fever, to allow them to come through. That is to prevent the almost un probably uncontrollable increase of the disease for the citizens of Brownsville. So this moment, uh, the U.S. Marine Hospital Service in Brownsville um, actually provided free medical care regardless of the disease that people had. The medical care that they provided was provided in people's houses so people would be treated in a community context. And the people who were doing the treating of people in Brownsville were the uh, Spanish speaking, uh, Mexican trained uh, nurses um, and teachers there. So this was a really good example of what primary health care that was concerned about the conditions that people were actually live in could provide. Um, so that was a success. This was not necessarily the takeaway that uh, the rest of the United States took from the 1882 uh, Texas Mexican yellow fever epidemic. Uh, the US Marine Hospital Service Secretary of the Treasury um, saw the vast expanse of um, territory covered by the Texas Mexican Railroad between Corpus Christi and Nueces. So they decided to hire the um, cowboys, um, the mostly Anglo employees of the King Ranch in 1882 and had them man the quarantine guard and decide who they thought was actually free of yellow fever and could go across the border and who mostly at gunpoint would then be forced to return to the towns of um, South Texas and not be allowed to escape from yellow fever. Um, prior to this, actually not prior to this, in general, the best way to avoid yellow fever was to move to higher ground where there were less mosquitoes. By doing this, by preventing people from leaving, people in the rest of the United States and Mexico thought that the US government was forcing people to be exposed to diseases and die. So what was one of the takeaways here? Um, once uh, people, Fewer people stopped coming down with yellow fever. Fewer people stopped dying uh, of yellow fever. The doctors 
in uh, Brownsville signed a petition of about 25 physicians asking the state, both the state of Texas um, and uh, the United States, to stop the quarantine. Uh, the quarantine wasn't stopped in Brownsville, um, around Brownsville until early November, November 10th. So between September 20, when all the sort of like established opinion in Brownsville and Matamoros was um, that, you know, it wasn't necessary to maintain the quarantine. The U.S., even though it didn't have any medical reason to keep the quarantine, they kept the quarantine going. And this kind of got remembered in a different way by some of the activists of um, and publicly involved people in Brownsville itself. Uh, some of you may know of Catarino Garza, who was um, uh, started a, a rebellion against Porfirio Diaz in the late 1890s. Part of his rebellion was against the way that Mexicans were treated both in uh, Mexico and the United States by ranchers, by businesses, by banks. Um, and in a sense, part of what he said really radicalized him was a particular statement that um, a person made during the Brownsville quarantine. Quote, Gentlemen, I have been assured that there are still cases of yellow fever in Matamoros. We should not raise a quarantine for any reason, even if it is starving or harming the working poor. We must stop any invasion of yellow fever to prevent any American deaths. Since one white man is worth 10 Mexicans, I stand against any attempt to raise a quarantine. Now, of course, no one in Brownsville had authority to raise a quarantine, but for Catarino Garza, this idea that a uh, Mexican was worth one-tenth the worth of a white citizen demonstrated to him the ways that people in the United States or Americans in the United States understood the worth, the relative worth and value of Mexicans. And this is one of the things that he used to explain his decision to start an armed rebellion right there. The next takeaway is that from 1882 to um, 1903, actually 1905, the U.S. adopted quarantines like the way that uh, it was established in, um, I guess, again, from Corpus Christi to Laredo and then sort of like moving south to Brownsville as a way to address yellow fever, to prevent the movement of yellow fever into the United States. So in a sense, um, it was a successful political experiment demonstrating that the political cost of establishing quarantine against the whole community of people living in South Texas could still be done. If, people's, um, if, and people would kind of take it. The next um, situation I want to sort of cover is actually what happened after the movement of railroads or the construction of railroads between um, large parts of the United States and large parts of Mexico. And I want to talk about a moment um, in U.S. history in 1894 when um, you had uh, highly contested elections uh, people with real fears about what the outcomes of these elections might mean for uh, vulnerable minority communities, uh, be they African-American communities across the South, uh, Mexican communities in California. Um, with the passage of, um, with the overthrow of Black electoral participation in Louisiana, in Texas, in Mississippi, African-Americans started looking to other places to see where they could be treated as full citizens. And for a large portion of people across um, the South or African-Americans across the South, they didn't come to Mexico, but Mexico with this sort of like ostensible idea that everyone was treated equally, that it was a community run by minorities, that it had a history of challenging slavery, um, and that people remembered that people were told not to go to Mexico before the Civil War because um, they would then, of course, be fleeing slavery. And that wasn't great. Mexico kind of stood as a possibility for people. So around this possibility, an ambitious uh, merchant out of Victoria um, made an arrangement with um, Porfirio Diaz and with the Tlaualilo Agricultural Company to move um, skilled cotton workers from the United States to what had once been a dry desert basin, but with the construction of an irrigation canal, it could become a place where people could grow cotton successfully and profitably. 
So according to William Ellis, there's a whole book about William Ellis or Guillermo Eliseo, um, African-American workers were five times as productive in cotton as uh, Mexican workers were in cotton be because of their knowledge, because of racial stereotypes, because he wanted to get this land contract to get to people. William Ellis spent four months recruiting people, mostly from Tuscaloosa, which is actually where I lived uh, when I moved to the United States as a middle schooler. But anyways, from Tuscaloosa and, and then down to um, Tlavalilo, which is now uh, San Pedro Mapimi and Torreón, along the railroad line that was there. This wouldn't have happened without the railroads, but they also would not have left if it wasn't for the um, lynching and um, racial backlash that happened after the 1892 and 1894 elections. But it also wouldn't have happened if there hadn't been fairly uh, racially integrated trading between Mexico and the United States along the railroad routes in other places. So when um, this group of colonists, uh, these African-Americans who arrived at the Tlaualilo Agricultural Company, uh, they thought they would be treated like um, people would given a chance to grow their own crops of cotton and other situations, but instead they were treated to um, as uh, seasonal laborers, treated as industrial laborers and told to work under task and under supervision, and they didn't really like it. Uh, they went on strike, they refused to work in particular things. Uh, I mean, basically went on strike for a couple months, only working just enough to get just enough money in terms of getting paid daily. And these sort of like their conditions got worse and worse and worse in terms of their general strike that they were doing. So they decided to uh, leave. Uh, Sam Claiborne, one of the people who were part of the um, colony made his way to a train station in uh, Torreón. In Torreón, the consul talked to him and reported that these workers found themselves in the worst form of bondage, not as bad as slavery, but in the worst form of bondage with no hopes of ever securing liberty. They were cruelly deceived, the food furnished being insufficient and not fit to eat. Um, due to change of climate, mode of living, they were not receiving proper medical attendance. So I want to sort of like point out, given this challenge of healthcare services, that people expected to be treated properly, especially when they had an emergency. When they, they managed to move and block to Torreón. In Torreón, the United States promised to pay for the rail expenses back to T Tuscaloosa after some negotiating. When they got to Eagle Pass, uh, the state of Texas did not allow them to leave Eagle Pass. It barely stopped them from coming into the United States. It couldn't do that because they were actually U.S. citizens, and it put them in a quarantine camp right there. And I have right there, there's a question like, oh, okay, it looks like they have smallpox, and at the same time, the U.S. Marine Hospital Service was trying to develop a serum therapy, exposing people to the serum, to the plasma that people had who had been exposed to smallpox and using that plasma to treat the smallpox that other people had. That is, this concentration of close to 400 people in Eagle Pass was, quote unquote, an opportunity not to be lost to put the serum therapy into effect. So um, what happened is, and one of the reasons there was such a quick um, federal intervention was that in Eagle Pass, um, a community that um, Muscogees lived by, that a number of African Americans fled Texas in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s, that um, had a large number of Kickapoo people living there. Um, the camp was there, but the residents of Eagle Pass kept on moving back and forth between the places where people were sick, selling goods, providing people to talk, treating people that even though they might be exposed to smallpox, since Eagle Pass folks were vaccinated already, had experienced a smallpox epidemic two years earlier, there wasn't much risk. But it's this intermingling and intercourse that gets reported that gets um, the U.S. Marine Hospital Service to come in, um, establish really strict walls around people, and uh, implement uh, treatment for the disease. And if you look <coughs> at um, the chart I have there, they use the plasma, the serum treatment on people, which didn't necessarily enhance people's conditions, didn't necessarily make it worse. It looks like they were used more likely on people who are older. And if you look at the um, diseases, the older you were, the more likely you were to die of disease um, and, and nothing, they didn't learn anything new. Um, 
but they were kept there for some time. And then even once smallpox cases happened, they kind of stopped uh, to make sure, negotiate to make sure they could be brought back by train to Tuscaloosa and the U.S. Marine Hospital Service after paying for their survival for another month after the African-American community across Texas organized to make sure people would be fed. They were finally allowed to ride a train through Austin, through Houston, uh, through New Orleans, and then between um, New Orleans and Tuscaloosa, between Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, they got out and made their way back either to Birmingham or to Tuscaloosa, marking a key moment when sort of like the quarantines and healthcare services intermingled the possibility of improving a serum treatment with trying to treat people the best way possible. And I noticed it's 342, and I think I could go on, but I'd much rather sort of like um, leave it open if people have questions about uh, the Laredo smallpox. Right, actually, I'm going to leave it on the last quote here. Um, there about why people kind of were offended about the ways that they were being treated by um, middle class and elite Mexican medical authorities in Laredo. And I want to leave it right there. Um, are there any questions? And I'm sorry that I, I get really excited about this and I get lost in the weeds. Um, but again, I'd like to point out all the ways in which citizenship, nationality, and treatment um, all got folded into each other in ways that weren't necessarily the best for people living in this particular part of the United States. No, yeah, that I got very invested in this as well. So I understand it's a very, very interesting uh, part of our history. Um, there is a question in the chat. Um, has have there been advancements regarding protocols in pandemic outbreaks today? Um, and I also was very interested in knowing about that, considering we just recently had the the COVID um, pandemic outbreak. Um, what do you think we've improved or have we improved? <laughs> well, um, this I, I, one of my fears was that um, people who were against vaccination would read my book and use it as a reason not to get vaccinations. So sort of like this discussions of sort of like public disagreements about the ways that people were being treated um, would be turned into like absolute disagreements over the ways that people were being treated at the time. Um, I think Milton Rosenau um, pushed consistently after this to avoid uh, quarantines because he did notice when he was running quarantines in um, in Alabama, in Eagle Pass, and then against plague in San Francisco, that the people who were within the quarantines um, did not do very well. But more than that, people avoided medical authority for fear that they would be quarantined and forced to sort of like give up some of their situations. So. Milton Rosenau pushed to make sure that people understood the reasons for quarantine, have a quarantine to have it be as minimal as possible and have people be involved. Um, I think if we look at the experiences during COVID, um, I mean, you can mark it in different ways, like pre-vaccine and post-vaccine, pre-Paxlovid and post-Paxlovid. So if we think of um, when we COVID-19 hit, um, before we had like treatments like Paxlovid for this and before we had the vaccine, it was similar to the situation in 1882 where people were trying things to see if they would work. Um, and, and I mean, they were shoot sometimes uh, cannons into the air to get sort of like stuff to come out of the air into these places. And I think things like right now, we know that sort of like wiping everything down isn't that helpful. For an airborne disease, we should probably be wearing, all be wearing masks and have really good ventilation in places to reduce the possibility of exposing ourselves to the um, well, the coronavirus in, in this case, um, in situations. But getting people to be understand and be involved in the reasons why more than sort of like the sim symbolisms of what these particular uh, public health precautions are. Um, so. I think the advance that we have um, is I think maybe in 20, early 2020, people thought that public health authorities could just declare something and people would follow. And now I think the advancement is that you have to convince and explain and persuade people 
to um, think for themselves, think for their families, and to think for other people um, in those conditions. So it's not necessarily a medical advance, but I do think there's a procedural advance based on our experience with COVID. And of course, we are living in a situation where people are using medical language uh, to try to separate between people who are all of whom are healthy or have the same distribution or similar distribution of disease, illness, and injury. Thank you so much. Um, one of the questions that like, I came up with while you were uh, speaking about this group that just got held because of the smallpox and the um the attempt to use this serum and everything um are there are there is there any indication that like they spotted this immediately and they just closed things down or did this start as like maybe we'll close things down for what well, we need an excuse to close things down um so we keep these people here because they're trying to leave so um, one of the so one of the things about smallpox is that there's usually a so I'm just going to go back to the situation and then kind of like flesh out a little bit. Um, there's a number of um, smallpoxes. Uh, some smallpoxes are more harmful than other smallpoxes, like variola mi major and variola minor, um, and they're both smallpox. So one of the big questions that people had was to try to figure out whether or not people had whether it was a minor version of smallpox or a major version of smallpox. And of course, that's perhaps isn't that helpful um, because A, it's painful and B like, oh no, it is major. It's too late to do anything about it. But smallpox was would move uh, kind of along its own rhythm. Once you've exposed and survived smallpox, you have immunity for anywhere between seven to 20 years. And then you begin to lose your immunity over time. Um, so in places where there had been smallpox, having a smallpox epidemic wasn't that big a deal. So like Eagle Pass that had had another smallpox epidemic three years earlier. Um, uh, Torreon that had a smallpox epidemic two years earlier. Like, okay, so we have people with smallpox, not as big a problem as my own. So I would say more the news that these folks were African-Americans, um, that they needed help, that they had fled the United States, um, and that they had a disease that was known to be painful, potentially mortal, and deeply disfiguring. Um, because of these other reasons, it was much easier to cordon off that community of African Americans um, than it would be otherwise. And of course, um, just three months earlier, uh, a Plessy versus Ferguson said that segregation or um, that segregation was legal. Uh, separate can be equal. So um, there was even a constitutional sanction for separating people from other people. So it was kind of like a, a perfect storm of factors that would allow people to be treated as medically separate, even though the justification for that was more social and cultural and political. Thank you. Um, there's also a question about the uh, ranchers or cowboys that were making the decision to turn people back um, because of the yellow fever, I believe it was, uh, yeah. epidemic. Um, were, did they have any training or was this just, you know, they made that decision and they turned people around? I, as far as I can tell, I have no record that they were given any training. Um, they were not, they were told to stop anyone from coming over. Um, so they would, able, would be able to stop anyone who looked like they were coming from South Texas, south of the King Ranch. Um, and then of course, because it was like one horse, one person, four miles, uh, one, it was hard to circle like police, but also if, if they knew someone who was trying to flee the epidemic and they were friends with them or they had familiar relationships, chances are they were allowed to go through and move up to Corpus or other places. So um, it would be what you and I might call a potentially arbitrarily implemented um, quarantine. But of course, the reason why uh, the US Marine Hospital Service hired people from King Ranch is that the US Marine Hospital Service found it easier to trust um, 
the owners of the King Ranch and the foreman at the King Ranch then to trust the uh, families and uh, politicians and elected officials in the smaller towns along South Texas. So one of my favorite things that emerges is that Swearingen, who was the uh, state health officer for Texas, uh, declared a quarantine in Brownsville, and then he tried to leave. Um, and along each town, um, along the Rio Grande, um, they would stop him because coming from a quarantine area that had just been declared quarantine and the local county judges, the majority of whom had Spanish surnames were like, no, you can't go through. You've been exposed to yellow fever. And he kept on saying, but I'm the state health officer. You can't stop me. Um, and it took him, I think, like uh, three weeks to get from Brownsville to Laredo when he was finally declared free of yellow fever. So they put him in jail and things. I don't know if they enjoyed it or not, but it was definitely fun to read about. Uh, there's a question from uh, Dr. St. Pierre, who uh, is the faculty that requested this uh, presentation. Thank you again, uh, Dr. St. Pierre, for working with the library to uh, coordinate this. Um, his question is, uh, are there innovative management practices or models that have been adopted to improve healthcare efficiency and effectiveness in Mexican border cities, especially post the recent pandemic? Um well, I would, I'll pull some of the stuff from here, and then I will turn the question back to Dr. Saint-Pierre and ask him if he knows of any of these methods. Um, and then I'll actually point that sort of like the, the following research project. So one uh, really good health service distribution was the house-to-house -house distribution of food and um, medical services, regardless of the illness that people had, during the Brownsville quarantine. Um, and we saw some of that actually um, during the pandemic. I think the tax credits were a dimension of that. Uh, the mutual aid that people did to deliver food to their neighbors um, also was some of that. Uh, I'd say DoorDash um, pizza delivery services were also part of that sort of like um, non-medical interventions that were really key to allow people to survive uh, with indoors away from other people. So I'd say that's something that's both from the Brownsville time as well as right now. Another thing, and this kind of goes back to the Laredo situation, um, that it's very hard to separate the way that people are treated from the everyday structures that lead people to be treated badly. So a lot of the people who were um, volunteered to go house to house to identify people with smallpox and then to burn all the goods that might have been exposed to smallpox in these working class houses uh, were the shopkeepers in downtown Laredo that probably didn't treat the people who lived in the more, um, the people who did uh, farm work and followed the railroads up and down. So they're being treated as, you know, possible disease bearers by the people from whom they owed, owed a level of money there was like a level of humiliation that was folded into the process. And I would say as health services, and this goes back to, I think my question to Dr. St. Pierre, is that I think um, after 1965, with the um, sort of like push to get more um, Mexican Americans into office, to get more uh, women into office, who then sort of like shaped the creation of the clinics in different places. And then we have, clinics with the ethos that everyone is included, or uh, I think one of the words is like cultura cura, who treats sort of like thinking about a culture that um, hugs. Uh, sorry, I'm going back into Spanish. Que abraza las culturas de la gente que vive ahí. That's part of the cultures that are there, that understands all the different questions that people have, that have structural competency, according to Jonathan Metzl, um, and can speak to the issues that um, communities are facing work. Um, if uh, Dr. Trinidad Gonzalez is here, um, his good friend Felipe Nojosa has wrote a wonderful piece on a clinic um, in Kingsville where the community and the physicians there embraced each other and worked each other to create um, a clinic that felt belonged to everyone. And of course, it was uh, met with deep hostility from some other parts of uh, the Kingsville area. Is that, is that the kind of answer you wanted, Dr. St. Pierre?
There's a wonderful book on Miami and the way the Cuban physicians opened up medical culture in Miami, um, including Santeria, including sort of like Catholic religious iconography, and including general concern with medical medicine, all in the same places and in the same clinics. Um, last name, MAS. Making Medicine Modern in Miami is the name of the book. Uh, Dr. St. Pierre responds and says, I was more curious, not that I know of any. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I was looking up the uh, the Cuban uh, healthcare. It's just, it's a very interesting way that um, cultures and uh, medical care sort of uh, intersect between one another and um, how we have to stay uh, uh, culturally um, educated um, so that we can work because the, the job is people and that's the language of people is everyone's culture. Um, I actually was curious because of your um, uh, experience working with uh, the AIDS Council, um, if you would be comfortable talking about how uh, the uh, AIDS epidemic um, necessarily impacted the uh, border. I know that um, a lot of times we're talking about uh, diseases that move, you know, over borders and whatnot because they are contact, they are airborne, they are all these different ways of transmitting, but I, I know a, a sexually transmitted disease is a little bit different. Um, how did that impact the uh, border area, either here or California or anywhere else? Well, um, I mean, there's a couple of things that were different then than they are now. Um, then if you were HIV positive, you couldn't come into the United States. Um, was treated as a dread disease. Um, the biggest uh, situation was um, people who were fleeing Haiti to come to the United States um, on the different boats that they took that they took and if they didn't make it to the United States. And even if they did, they were placed in an AIDS quarantine camp on Guantanamo until they could be treated or their status could be. Um, treated in a number of other ways. Um, the other thing is that unlike, let's say a cold or COVID, um, if you do become, since I was there, if you do become seropositive, you do start testing positive for HIV, um, it takes a long time uh, for there to be evidence. So at least three months to get a positive test and then another six months for that to happen. So um, putting a quarantine on people. So the other thing is that, of course, the um, centers of the HIV epidemic were in San Francisco, in Texas, it was Dallas, in Houston, in Austin, in San Antonio. Um, so when people would sort of like have HIV, um, what did happen, and this goes back to Dr. St. Pierre's um, research on health services, a lot of people would then go home to spend time with their families, uh, their last six months, a uh, place where they could sort of like, they, they could be with their families and die peacefully um, in a way. So the, the border issues facing that broadly was that people would be allowed to go spend um, hospice care, uh, spend time with their families in rural Mexico. Um, there, were, I, I would call them sort of like hyper visible situations where people were really concerned with um, what people did with their time if they were truckers in Laredo, like you're waiting for your uh, there, there's nothing much to do. So you might go for a couple of drinks, you might date some people. Um, I'm still a child of the 80s, you might uh, engage in um, unsafe sexual practices. Um, and that because it was so visible having truckers and trucks and that being part of that, there was a real concern with, um, with truckers and with um, sex workers in a way that allowed everyone else to uh, forgive themselves for engaging in unsafe sex practices with themselves. Um, so the, yeah, so I think it was like the HIV pandemic caused a minor panic 
about truckers and sex workers um, in El Paso and in Laredo. But it didn't, it didn't work out the way that I think COVID has worked out. And of course, COVID, COVID went from the United States to Mexico and not the other way around. Thank you for answering that. Um, there's a question too about um, the issues maybe seen in California, Arizona, New Mexico borders. Um, is there anything about like the Texas border itself that is special or are these the sorts of issues that we see across all sort of all kinds of state boundaries? I mean, I think what makes the Texas border special is that our governor thinks that the Texas border is special. Um, so the um, the attention and the use of razor wire and the National Guard to prevent the movement of disease seems not to really fit sort of like the movement of disease, perhaps in particular. Um, what all these, what let's say Tijuana and San Diego share with um, Calexico and Mexicali and share with uh, Ambos Nogales and share with Ciudad Juarez and El Paso and share with um, Laredo No Laredo and with Brownsville Matamoros and Mexicali and Reynoso is that these are all really large industrial cities with lots of family and other connections between them. And they're also places where a lot of goods go back and forth. Um, and so there, a lot of the economy is based on moving goods through these cities. So it's not surprising that they, um, that the people are, get sick of the same illnesses that people get sick of in other places. So what I do think distinguishes um, the South Texas border area from the South Texas border area is that relative to Southern New Mexico, relative to Southern California, um, relative to Nogales, that there's less primary care services available. I think um, I heard that there was what, maybe four um, psychologists in Cameron County available to become in. I mean, I think this is like apocryphal that I heard from folks at UTRGV, but the general distribution of um, healthcare services is lower per capita in Texas than it is in New Mexico and California. I mean, it's nice that you can cross over into um, Reynosa and get access to cheaper antibiotics and cheaper drugs and cheaper dental services, but that's not a responsible solution for the relative lack of affordable drugs and dental services and uh, psychological services in South Texas. Thank you. Um, there's another question about going back to the movement of COVID. You mentioned that uh, the disease basically moved from uh, the um, uh, the U.S. into Mexico as opposed to the other direction. Um, why do you say that for one and for two? Like, you know, what what kind of data do we have that basically oh. indicates that? Well, so. So one, um, COVID spread by plane. Um, I mean, I know the first quarantine was for the poor folks on the cruise ship off the coast of California who uh, came down with COVID and sort of like suffered the first um, quarantine. But in general, it spread from flights from Wuhan uh, to other places, to Italy, Italy to England, England to New York, um, from Wuhan to Southeast Asia, to Hawaii, to California, and out from there. So the first phase of, um, of the epidemic, the people who were coming down with COVID were people who were in the richer, more connected um, cities in the United States, and then spreading out uh, from there to other places. Um, Right now, I forget when uh, the World Health Organization um, turned uh, COVID from being an epidemic to being a pandemic, but uh, the definite when the World Health Organization decided that um, COVID was a pandemic is that it was equally distributed all across the world that um, for all intents and purposes, 
um, people were, um, people were, uh, there was COVID everywhere and it was sort of like transforming in different ways in different places, um, like the flu. So we don't say like, oh my God, I'm getting the flu from Mexico, even though we did have the H1N1 epidemic where people said exactly that. Um, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So holding all of Mexico responsible for the movement of COVID between people who are or are not wearing masks um, seems troubling to me. Or not troubling. The whole situation is troubling that we have a disease we can't eradicate. But um, holding people responsible for the movement of airborne viruses um, is a pro is hard to match up with what we know about how diseases are transmitted. Thank you. Um, I actually was also curious because you mentioned about goods moving back and forth uh, over the border and everything. I know that we have a lot of students that are attending this uh, webinar who are specifically going into health management services. Um, I know another thing that we have to worry about, not just diseases and all that, but also the impact of uh, drugs on um, uh, human bodies and how you know, we can have the, the we had the opioid crisis. Um, we've had fentanyl being a, a, a very scary um, uh, uh, substance out there. Um, can you speak a little bit about how that impacts uh, border areas? Uh, or is I this outside be, of- This is outside of my expertise. <laughs> okay. um, I, I will say like, I mean, it's outside of my expertise, but it is within what people discuss in the history of medicine. So I can mm -hmm. transmit what people discuss in the history of medicine. And um, so one of the sort of like big sort of like experiments in C2 uh, that happened in the history of the United States is actually um, the lack of uh, ad ad the relative lack of addictions that happened after the demobilization from Vietnam. Most records for, um, there's a number of reports by military physicians, by other people that estimated that close to 60 to 70% of people, of soldiers in Vietnam, not just sort of like um, smoke marijuana, but also injected sort of like harder levels of drugs but when they came back to the United States, the expectation was that this would then, this habit would then infect the rest of the United States. Um, and what actually ended up happening is that the vast majority of Vietnam vets uh, went on with their lives, um, used the GI Bill, had jobs, took advantage of their new status as veterans to be able to get small business loans, and et cetera. And of course, there are large, like proportionate to the population that didn't serve in Vietnam. Um, there are, of course, higher levels of suicide, higher levels of addiction. But compared to the stresses of um, being a soldier in Vietnam, um, people are doing much better uh, and they're not being shot at. So the larger part of this is that there are ways that um, addiction, like being exposed to drugs, doesn't automatically addict you. Um, but more than that, if you bring people in who are living with addiction into the general processes of life, who are given a level of hope, um, hope, I sound terrible, hope and structural help um, can heal addiction or can help you live with addiction. But again, that's a little out of my expertise, the, the present fentanyl situation. And, and then, of course, it's one of those they like people like saying. Um, people like saying um, that fentanyl is different and maybe it is. Um, oh, no, this is what people like saying that 90 percent of the people detained at the border with fentanyl on them are U.S. citizens. Um, I don't know what that means. Thank you. Um... I have not had any more questions come across in uh, the the chat so far. Uh, Dr. St. Pierre, if you have any more, please let me know. Um, or if anyone is typing something right now and you're you're just in the middle of it, just give me a, give me an idea <laughs> that that's what you're doing. Um, okay.
doesn't look like I have anyone. Nothing else at this time. Okay. Um, yes. Um, are there, oh, there's still 72 participants. Okay. So I, oh, won't, yeah. yes. I won't move <laughs> to the informal chat. <laughs> Um, so one of the things I did want to say about uh, the Laredo smallpox um, epidemic, or actually smallpox quarantine, is that um, what after people were being taken from their houses and put in a hospital dedicated to smallpox, otherwise known as a pest house, which was placed in the old um, tannery, where leather was processed, that they'd just been closed, so it kind of smelled. Um, people did not want to be diagnosed with smallpox and tried to stop people from breaking into their houses to take people to be treated in a place where they would probably die and not be very happy and it would be kind of miserable. Um, when people lined up with rocks to stop people from coming and taking them to do this in terms of marking a, a big distinction, uh, the city authorities after getting rocks thrown at them, called in the Texas Rangers to clear these folks out. And then in the neighborhood just south of downtown, they met um, the Texas Rangers couldn't clear the space. So they then had to call in the 10th Cavalry, uh, which was, of course, the African-American soldiers, um, who then when they showed up on horses and machine guns, things did clear out and people did cooperate, of course, at the end of a gun to go along with the smallpox process. Um, however, in sort of like histories of the Texas Rangers, um, Walter Prescott Webb uses the story to say like, and this is why the Rangers are special and are able to do this, but actually the Rangers didn't do this. It was the black cavalry that was able to sort of like implement this kind of piece. Um, and it, that story has been erased from broad Ranger mythology and iconology. And I just kind of wanted to do that because I think one of the um, most important um, advocates of remembering the particular history of South Texas told me that he would actually be here uh, for this talk. So Trini Gonzalez, I just wanted to sort of like um, um, shout out for all the incredible public work you've done to remember the particular details and the texture of life on the border between 1910 and 1920 and everything else. Yes, I saw him uh, on the uh, in the chat. Uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Trini, for being here. <laughs> so, well, excellent. Uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. McKiernan Gonzalez, for uh, joining us for this discussion. Um, I hope those of you who joined us got a lot out of it. I know I did. Um, and uh, again, if you are able to, I would really appreciate your uh, feedback on our library survey. Um, if you're unable to get it now because you are listening to us via phone or anything like that, you should get a follow-up email that asks you for it because I am very persistent <laughs> about getting responses to that survey. Um, and uh, I uh, want to- You can share my yes. PowerPoint if you'd like. Oh, I, yes. I don't feel any, it's, it's all in the- Better to get the book, which is hopefully available to you free <laughs> in your library. Um, and then if you are in health services management, find ways to give the chance for patients and staff to talk to each other. Those moments of just communion make a big difference down the line. I know that when my mom is in the hospital, I make sure to bring candy for everyone on the floor so that they know that someone is caring for my mom in the hospital. Yes. Yeah. I have a, a niece who is uh, getting her nursing degree. Um, she's been working at a uh, hospital in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Um, and she just absolutely loves uh, when patients come in and just basically speak to her, talk to her, and give her the ability to connect. Um, I think that's an incredibly important part of uh, medical care is, you know, we have to, we have to connect with one another. Like that's how we treat uh, people. And that's how we uh, uh, basically overcome large uh, challenges like diseases, like drug addiction, like systemic 
issues that have put us in unfortunate positions. So uh, thank you again, uh, 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 Dr. McKiernan Gonzalez, and thank you to the Organization of American Historians for helping us. I saw Sally in the chat. Thank you, Sally, for Sally, uh, helping. Sally, okay. <laughs> so... Um, and yes, those of you who have asked about uh, a recording, we we do have this uh, uh, webinar recorded and it will be uh, posted on the uh, SCC Library uh, YouTube channel, uh, likely within uh, the next few weeks. It takes me a little bit of time to edit things and do captions and all that. So, but uh, for those of you who stuck around, I appreciate it. Um, you will be getting your uh, certificates of attendance uh, in your email. So keep an eye on the email that you use to register for Zoom. Uh, that is where it will come in. And it should take me about like 48 hours or so to get them all issued. So I do them by hand. So it takes me a little bit of time. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording now.